So it was necessary to control the amount of carbon in the steel, and on a separate note, you also had to know what temperature to forge the blade at. European blacksmiths didn't understand either. What? Are you kidding me? Where the heck did you get that from? Shadowverse. Greetings, I'm Shad. And in case this is the first time you're visiting my channel, I am a medieval enthusiast and sword enthusiast very much so. So much so that misinformation about swords bothers me. And one of the reasons I started this channel was to correct a lot of the misinformation out there. And over the years, I've done many a reply video correcting some other videos, usually popular ones that get a lot of traction, uh, correcting errors in them. And when the video comes out that uh, a lot of people end up watching that is riddled with errors and misinformation, well, I do like to correct them. And of course, no, you know, insults to them. I've made mistakes as well and stuff like that. And in this one, oh boy, we got a, we got a big one. And I, when I say big is that there's a lot of errors in this video, specifically almost 80% is like just misinformation to just utter falsehood. It's like, it's not. The video in question is titled The Lost Recipe of Damascus Steel, made by SciShow, which is a little unfortunate because I'm a fan of SciShow. They're one of the first YouTube channels I subscribed to when I started watching the platform. So I'm a long time subscriber. And of course, I don't watch all their videos, everything. I just think, hey, I feel like, you know, a good SciShow video here and there. And to my knowledge, they've generally been well informed. This one was shockingly, and I mean shockingly bad in regards to how incorrect many of the statements are. And uh, so much so, another YouTuber even reached out to me just saying, hey, have you seen this video? And we then teamed up together, pulled our resources and our knowledge uh, to get all the facts straight, all of the ducks in a line, as the saying goes. We've got all sources for the things that we're saying here. And the YouTuber that has helped me out here is I Post Swords. And so he's also going to be appearing in this video, sharing some specific details as well. So thank you to I Post Swords for joining me here on this, on this bit of a rebuttal. And and do go check out his channel. He has phenomenal content about swords. I am subscribed. You subscribed for a while. And together we've done a lot of research, not to find this, because we're actually very well aware of the errors in this video, but to also come back with direct sources to show you, all right, this is, you know, so it's not just us saying whatever, you know. It's all sourced, links in the description to those sources, and uh, we need to get into it. But before we continue, I do want to mention this video sponsor, which I think you'll really like, because if you're interested in, you know, Damascus steel, and also interesting kind of good quality steels that exist in the past, in comparison to other steels that were inspiration to fantasy steels and things like Valyrian steel from Game of Thrones, stuff like that. Well, you might be interested in world building, creation, storytelling, everything like that. And the sponsor of this video is Campfire Blaze, which is this brilliant writing assist program, which enables you to do so much more. Now I'm an author, there's my book, Chronicles of Everfall, Shadow of the Conqueror. And I know from experience that when I'm making my world building document and histories, the character backstories, the races, the languages, the magic eyes, stuff like that, it becomes really hard to find out where you put things, the categories and all that stuff. So Campfire Blaze enables you to sort everything with really easable links and, and connections where you can do full world histories, racial backgrounds, all the details you want. It has interactive maps and all these great features. So you can just have all the world building stuff at your fingertips and it becomes so easy to look up things because it's all references. You can make links and all those great things as well. It has an inbuilt word processor so you can actually write your whole story. If you have access to a browser, you can access Campfire Blaze. It's all there. It has full privacy and one of the most flexible payment systems that you can get. You can opt to pay one off payments for the features you want. So you're not paying for features that you don't get or you could do a cheaper subscription service. And so it's always there available when you need it at a more affordable price. If you like writing, world building, role playing, game development, any number of things like that, you will get a tremendous use out of Campfire Blaze. It's brilliant. And something that you might want to keep track of in your world building document are the type of technologies available, the type of steels that are available, because it's actually a really interesting thing. If you have one culture who has access to a superior type of steel, like high carbon steel, when everyone else is using bronze, that would appear like a super metal in that setting. And you could also add kind of mythological, which we kind of see in the historical record of the Damascus steel, a mythological kind of reputation for it that it just evolves around because people misunderstand what's actually happening. What's unfortunate is some of that mythology actually gets carried over into the modern day and people ignore 
just regular hard facts and science about metallurgy and other things, but it's something that you could add into your story and why this video subject might be inspiration to you in your oil building as well. So do go check out Campfire Blaze if you're really interested. There's a link in the description below. I highly recommend it. Thank you to Campfire Blaze for sponsoring this video. And now let's continue on the misinformation, unfortunate misinformation that we see in the SciShow video on Damascus Steel. There are a couple of important caveats that I do need to mention before we go into a specific breakdown of the video. Video, but these caveats are going to help contextualize some important things that the video actually also gets wrong in a broader sense. And so it's important. And the stuff that I'm going to be sharing, you'll start to realize, oh, because one of the things that this video gets wrong mostly, or at the very least, should have made clearer, because it's a very big misunder... Like, the the topic of Damascus Steel is hugely misunderstood, okay? Just the term itself. And so defining exactly what terms you're using would have been really helpful. And only towards the very end of the video do they actually touch on that one of the big, huge errors and misconceptions about what Damascus Steel is. And people assume it's any sword that has a metal-like pattern on the blade. And this is often achieved through pattern welding. Now, historical proper Damascus steel that is referenced to, you know, in the historical record is not pattern welded steel. That, like, so you really need to understand that. Now, this idea that uh, Damascus steel is just anything that has this fancy pattern gets perpetuated a lot. And I'm looking at you, Alex Steele. I love you. I love your content, okay, but and it's almost so like with Alec and other people just saying Damascus steel is pattern welding, the actual definition is kind of shifted in the modern day that you can't even refer to Damascus steel as the proper Damascus steel historically because people misunderstand and assume that it's pattern welded. So much so that even the thumbnail of SciShow's video shows pattern welded steel when they're trying to represent Damascus steel, like, like proper true Damascus steel. And so the confusion is so muddled that you need to use like additional terminology to define exactly what I'm saying so people know what you're referring to now. And that's what I need to also outline and define just quickly so you know what I'm referring to. There is another term that is used sometimes to refer to Damascus, which gets a bit confusing as well, and it's called woots. Okay, first of all, Woots essentially is a old timey kind of word name for crucible steel, okay? More specifically, Woots is a corruption and evolution from the word ukar, uku, or utsa, a Sanskrit word for foundation, or uku, ruku, the word for steel in the Indian language of Kannada and Old Tamil, respectively. So the original meaning of the word from which Woots is derived simply means steel. But in the modern day, it is actually used more regularly to refer to true Damascus steel, but another accurate application of the word Woots refers to crucible steel from India. All true Damascus steel is crucible steel. So essentially it's Woots. Damascus steel is usually defined by the pattern on the blade, but it's not achieved through pattern welding. Pattern welding is when you interlay different, you know, grades of metal and you're able to uh, twist them, do these fancy things. And Alex Steele does amazing things with pattern welding, even though he gets the terms wrong, he does amazing things. Again, love you, mate. And when you etch it with acid, you can really bring those patterns out and they shine and they can look amazing. But true, proper, actual Damascus steel isn't made through uh, pattern welding, okay? It's actually a pattern that naturally arises right down in as a result of the microstructure or what's happening in the steel if you also use the right elements in it. And one of the elements that, of course, Sasha points out, and they are correct in this one, but there are misunderstandings about that, is vanadium. Now, the pattern, you can actually identify, if you know what you look for, you can easily identify true Damascus steel versus fake Damascus steel. Now, for the terms going forward, just so I understand, when I'm referring to true Damascus steel, I need to make a uh, qualifier. So I'm going to either refer it to as true or refer to it as Woots Damascus, okay? Because now, just thanks to the misinformation that exists in the world today, when you say Damascus Damascus steel, it can mean anything with a pattern on top of it, okay? So Woots Damascus. Now, the look of proper Woots Damascus is almost liquid, okay? If you have a look, the patterns don't usually have like sharp edges, they're usually a bit flowy, it's almost like ripples in water. And you could always pick out what it really looks like. It's like when you know what you're looking for, this is proper true Damascus, historical, you know, what it looked like. And how do we know? Well, we have surviving blades of true Damascus steel that were made, antiques, Ipo swords, 
You know, the guy helped me out. He owns several. He, he knows his stuff really well when it comes to true Damascus. This, on the other hand, including the type of steel that I show you, you know, shows in the thumbnail, is not true Damascus. And the whole video is about true Damascus, and they're showing pattern welded garbage. It's not, it's not, it actually can look really, really nice, but I'm just saying it's garbage because it's a garbage representation of what true Damascus is, and it just annoys me. And that is like, there is so much wrong in this video that even the thumbnail is wrong. The next broader error that I'm going to go on to before going to the specific actual point by point errors that SciShow, the SciShow video perpetuates is kind of perpetuating a mythology around Damascus steel. And uh, it's interesting because this is similar to kind of like the mythology that exists around tamahagane, the steel that is used in the Japanese katana. And people start to think that this is like Valerian steel, even though Valerian steel from Game of Thrones was actually kind of inspired by true Damascus, that it is somehow incredible super steel, greater than every other type of steel in the world, carbon nanotubes. We'll be talking about carbon nanotubes later on. But to put things in perspective right away, true Damascus or Wheat's Damascus is uh, essentially just good crucible, actually not even always good crucible steel, okay? Sometimes it was poor, it was actually a range, okay? And, like the identifying quality of Wheat's Damascus was the pattern and usually because the pattern is made through the crucible process, the steel would be pure and higher carbon. And higher carbon means stronger. It was high carbon steel, okay? Which meant good. Didn't mean it was best in the world. And in actual fact, modern steels, because we can make them so precisely, like, like down to the minute decimal point of uh, different, you know, elements that we put in to add the very subtle qualities to change the uh, performance of these steels. And we can make them like almost wholly pure without any imperfection stuff like that. Modern steel is actually very superior to historical Damascus, okay? Historical Damascus isn't Valyrian steel, it's better than all others, stuff like that. It was crucible steel that had a pattern on it. And the pattern was beautiful and therefore prized. It wasn't always great. In some instances, crucible steel could produce inferior, weaker steel if they made some errors along the way, or if you stuffed up the process. And there are ways to stuff it up, okay? So it wasn't a glorious, if you got the pattern, it's always going to be great. The pattern was an indicator that the steel would be high carbon because of the crucible process, as I mentioned, but it wasn't a guarantee. We're not talking about a magical metal. But SciShow's video really perpetuates that it can do, like, you know, Damascus steel swords, like true Damascus steel, can do things that other steels, that they even go out of their way to say, that other specifically European swords just couldn't do. It's like, <laughs> but overall, by statements like that and other statements that make it through the video, they are creating this pseudo scientific mythology that it's so amazing because carbon nanotubes and other things like, again, carbon, we'll talk about carbon nanotubes. For instance, SciSho, they make a comment about, you know, Damascus sword being able to cut silk in half, okay? And uh, this is, when I say it's a myth, it's not saying that is essentially incorrect, okay? But saying it in the context that they could do this, that other swords can't, that they're so superior, of course, you see this mythology thing. And I was talking with Ipo Swords about it, and he mentioned to me that when you create this mythology, it almost uh, like prevents critical thinking about it because people are starting to expect or think it's just so great. When, no, when you actually think about it, seriously, logically, there are some very blatant, obvious answers that you reach and these myths that they're perpetuating are wholly contrary to them. Like a sword, because it's made out of, you know, true Damascus, can be sharper than any other sword. I mean, that statement alone shows that they really don't understand how swords work and how sharpness works on blades, okay? You can sharpen anything up to an insanely razor sharp edge. Or when I say anything, mostly any steels, okay? If it's low carbon, crappy, impure steel, you can sharp it to beyond a razor edge. The quality of steel doesn't affect how sharp you can make the blade. It affects how long it will hold that edge. Absolutely. And there's an interplay between the sword quality and the edge and edge retention. So they're related. But in terms of just how sharp you can get something, you can get plain iron razor sharp, sharp enough to cut silk, right? And so the fact that they can make these statements and are completely oblivious to scientific realities, and it's called SciShow, is astounding. Now, look, I'm going in harsh because they made some really big errors and uh, 
I understand that people can make errors, okay? I've made errors myself as well. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. So this really seems like whatever research they did, maybe they just got it off Wikipedia, stuff like that. Sometimes Wikipedia can be reliable, but in other times when the subject requires a lot of nuance and there's a lot of detail and a lot of misinformation already existing, you need to do a lot more effort than that to find the answers because this video really is like a surface level Wikipedia style research because, and I think I think they've even thrown in just popular myth in it as well because <laughs> they literally just perpetuate some of the most blatantly false things like European swords simply couldn't do certain things and that they were brittle and I was like what? Oh gosh. Here's another hard-hitting fact about true Damascus steel, and it's that it is not always better than, say, bloomery steel or other types of steels. It has higher chances of being better, but that's different because you need to understand some important things. First of all, just having pure higher carbon steel doesn't necessarily mean it'll be make a better sword. There are other elements in the sword making process which are crucial for how well that sword performs when in use. For instance, the quenching and tempering stage. If you have good quality crucible steel, even with a fancy pattern that you get from True Damascus and you stuff up the quenching and tempering phase, that can result in a worse sword than a sword that has higher impurities, has less carbon in it, but absolutely nailed the quenching and tempering phase. And so you could have a sword that's made out of, say, bloomery steel or other types of steel because there are other methods of making it, and it can still be a better sword. And so the idea that if a sword is, you know, Woots Damascus is always superior is incorrect, okay? There are a lot of other factors that need to be measured to determine if this sword may out of Woots Damascus is actually good, but it has a higher chance of being good because by the natural manufacturing process, you can actually eat, get higher carbon steel in a much easier way. And if the temperature reached the right amount during the smelt, most of those impurities, when I say most, nearly all of them will have just risen to the surface because the steel is fully liquefied. In a bloomery furnace, it doesn't fully liquefy, and so there are usually a lot more impurities in them, but those impurities can be removed to a large degree, not all of them, through, say, folding. This is what they did with the Japanese katana. And yes, shock horror, the Japanese katana was made out of bloomery steel. The steel that comes out of the Tatara, the Tamahangane, and there are actually other grades of steel that I was put into the katana making, actually has a lot of impurities in it. That's the whole reason why they were needed to be folded. There's no need to fold steel if the steel is already pure. But it also goes to show you that you can get really good quality swords, okay, because proper made katana made the best way to get the best results, is a phenomenal sword. Really good quality, okay. Uh, spring steel is also another discussion, but that's for another video. But it's still very good quality, and it's made from bloomery steel. There are some other potential problems with crucible steel, and this means Woots and Woots Damascus. Crucible steel can run into problem if the phosphorus content was too high or if they didn't remove sulfur from the iron before the smelt. Now, it is a total incorrect miscon misconception to perpetuate the idea that all crucible steel has too high phosphorus content and too high sulfur. Uh, also, it's incorrect to think that phosphorus content is always bad in blades. It's actually a certain amount of phosphorus in iron can produce stronger steel. And so the idea that phosphorus is always bad is wrong. Also, the idea that phosphorus is removed in other types of steel manufacture, like like a bloomery uh, smelt is completely incorrect. There's a link in the description to the study. In fact, I got my notes here. This is from the study. Uh, the technology of ancient and medieval directly reduced phosphoric iron under section 3.1.ii. They found that it's actually extremely difficult to remove phosphorus from iron through forging or bloomery technology, so much so that it was even too difficult to replicate reliably in a controlled atmosphere, finding that it was not possible to model the process using phase diagrams. Why is this relevant? Because there's nuance to understand on the subject. Ilya from that work made a video talking about crucible steel, Woots Damascus, and claimed that there were some inherent inferiorities with uh, crucible steel because it locks everything in and there was no way to burn off sulfur and phosphorus. And there's more things in that video that I'd like to reply to, so maybe that'll have its own dedicated video. But right now, just to point out that phosphorus can be bad, but it can be good in iron. It depends on the quantities, but you can't even get phosphorus through bloomery smelting as you can't get rid of it in a crucible. And if there is too high phosphorus or different amounts, it will result in some very poor results, even if this is glorious Woots Damascus steel, okay? If you just get an iron source that doesn't have much phosphorus in the first place, not a problem. And if you have sulfur in the iron, well, you just pre-bake it. And baking pits, actually, I 
think they're called roasting pits, was used extensively in the medieval period and other areas. It was a standard practice in many smelting, you know, endeavors to pre-roast the iron, and that gets rid of moisture, but it also gets rid of any sulfur. Citing this article, From the Soil to the Iron Period, the Technology of Medieval Iron Smelting, this article states uh, explicitly that they found more than 300 early medieval bloomery workshops, which they were excavated, and in them they found roasting pits. In each one. The f over 300, okay? That's how standard it was. Of course, this isn't to say that it's impossible to find medieval swords or Indian swords that have phosphorus or sulfur in them. This includes if they're made out of bloomery steel or crucible steel. Sword quality was always on a spectrum, and you can find swords of poor quality steel and swords of phenomenal quality steel, and it's very much determined by the region or also the period in which the sword was built and the current technology available. So when I say crucible steel had the ability to produce inferior steel to bloomery steel, it is not a universal. More often than not, crucible steel would be much better than bloomery steel because it's high carbon with less impurities, but it's not a guarantee, it's not a universal condition. There are a lot of circumstances in which it can produce poor steel. Also, the best quality crucible steels are never as good as the best quality modern steels. We need to stop mythologizing the past in such a way that we can't look at it critically. And some of the problems people say inherently exist with crucible steel, like phosphorus content, exist just as much with bloomery steel because the phosphorus isn't removed in a bloomery furnace as it isn't removed in a crucible. And sulfur, that's the only issue if you can burn it off. But if sulfur is put in the crucible, the sulfur doesn't get burnt off because it's trapped in there. And that can cause less optimal steel as a result, which will cause the sword to not perform as well if you make a sword out of it. And so the idea that just because it's Woot's Damascus is better, no. Okay, there's actually a lot of signs and a lot of factors, and it's nuanced, funnily enough, because reality usually is. So with those broader mistakes out of the way, which are very important to debunk, because these are, like I said, the general misinformation that the video perpetuates just throughout this whole thing. Now, we're going to get into the specifics, point by point breakdown now. Uh, let's get started. The first thing that we need to address, and this is before the video even plays, is the title, uh, The Lost Recipe of Damascus Steel. It, it, it wasn't lost. This is a good fact that a good old Ipo sword shared with me. The recipe is from Alexandrian alchemist uh, Zosimos of Panapolis, all the way to Maskaleski, which was published in 1841, are known. So we actually do have the recipes for Damascus, but they weren't aware of some of the finer details like, say, the vanadium. And there are a couple of other things further into the video about this lost art, when in reality, it's actually not, not nearly as lost as they're, they're claiming. Today, Damascus blades are famous for their intricate, swirling patterns, but in ancient times, these Middle Eastern swords were mainly known for their sharpness. So I already addressed this in the video, that true Damascus steel swords were renowned for their sharpness, okay? The concept of perpetuating a mythology around a certain thing, of course, existed in the past as well, and so you can easily see how people would picture, like, it's Damascus, it's so sharp, stuff like that, because if people misunderstood in the modern day, they can, of course, misunderstand this in the past as well, but the dynamics that are at play are exactly the same. The science is the same. You can get iron as sharp as anything else. It's about how long it holds its sharpness. Now, they could be renowned for that, for how long they hold their edge. And in a general sense, there could be this idea that they are generally sharper, just because when you sharpen them up, they hold their you know, edge longer, which means they are usually sharper than other swords which have gone dull quicker. But if you keep the swords that are not as hard with as high carbon steel, if you're sharpen it, sharpening it regularly, you can have these other swords just as sharp. Okay. It's said that they were so sharp they could cut silk in midair, something European swords definitely couldn't do. How do you know that? Like, really? Like, where's your source for that one? Something European swords like, couldn't cut do, like... And, <laughs> <sighs> this also gets to an area that I'm always a bit hesitant about, which is the mythological statements about what swords can do. Like, have you heard that statement that a katana can chop a machine gun barrel and stuff in half and stuff like that? And so there's this idea that you could cut silk mid-air. It's like, because I've seen other things over-exaggerated and sometimes just full-blown false, it's like, okay, I actually haven't seen silk cut through the air, but this is the reality, okay? If a true Damascus steel sword could cut silk through the air, so could any sword of similar sharpness. Period. That's the reality. I'm skeptical any sword could actually do this. I would need to see it to be convinced. I'm not saying it's impossible, okay? I actually don't know the material properties of silk and how resistant they are to being cut, or if they would just get caught on the blade and pulled with the blade when you try and cut it through. And what type of cut? Do you, is it a type of special drawing cut when you draw it through the air and let the silk kind of flutter along the blade and then cut like that? So there are a lot of things that comes into play about this. But if a sword is capable of achieving that, it means any sword of the same sharpness would be able to do the same. 
logic science people. You call it the science sci show, but to get that fact wrong, and also to perpetuate that they could do something and using a historical written source saying they did this without testing it uh, is dubious, okay? Because you think historical records don't embellish things now and then to promote the you know, grandiose abilities of certain things in the past. Of course they did. And so if you really want to find out if something can be done according to historical record, this is where experimental archaeology comes in, where you try it yourself. So you would imagine that these blades were popular, but blacksmiths made the last batch of true Damascus swords back in the 1800s. And after that, despite the efforts, nobody was able to forge these blades. SciShow says nobody was able to forge these blades since. Except they have. People have reproduced the Nabascus pattern, Nabascus steel from crucible steel. I, I, it's it's a, almost a common thing. When I say common, it's like more than one person can do it. Now, the people who are reproducing Damascus steel is largely thanks to the work of two guys, and I'll just quickly, uh, Pendre and uh, Verhoeven. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your names, but Mike Lodes has a brilliant documentary on True Woots Damascus and the recreating of it right here. I'll link it in the description because you see these two gentlemen there and how they are able to figure it out as well. The iron ores that we pull from the ground are mostly a mixture of iron along with impurities like oxygen, sulfur, and silicon. So if you want a blade made with iron, you need to remove some of those impurities. One way to do that is to heat the ore beyond its melting point. But for iron, that's way easier said than done. To melt it, you need to crank up the heat to 1,540 degrees Celsius. And for much of history, we just didn't have the technology to do that. When you say much of history, just how much of history are you saying? I like really, because this is interesting. It seems to be implying that there's a crucible technology and bloomery technology, and that was it. And no one else figured out how to make a furnace uh, it's hot enough to be able to liquefy iron. It's like, really? Have you ever heard of the blast furnace? Well, guess what? Certain parts in medieval Europe had blast furnace technology much sooner than people think, actually in the medieval period. The earliest instance uh, of, yeah, we've actually found a proper blast furnace uh, dates to 1100 AD. Okay, so this is 12th century, and this information is from the article From Bloomery to Blast Furnace. Again, link in the description below. But from the 12th century onward, certain parts of Europe in the medieval period had blast furnace technology, which absolutely can liquefy iron. And it became more widespread the more the medieval period progressed. And the fully liquefied iron that you get through a blast furnace removes nearly all the impurities. It becomes very pure steel. There is an interesting kind of drawback when you use a blast furnace because it's not sealed. It's not in a sealed crucible. And this is one of the interplays and benefits of crucible steel, though blast furnace allows for uh, larger quantities of steel production. But when iron fully liquefies, it absorbs carbon at a much higher rate. And so the advantage of a crucible is that you can put in the exact amount of carbon you want in that crucible, and the liquefied iron is only going to absorb the amount of carbon it has access to, which is sealed in the crucible. But in a blast furnace, well, it has a lot of access to a lot of carbon, and as a result, it's very hard to modulate the amount of carbon specifically that you want in a blast furnace, and you usually get what is called cast iron. And you're thinking, huh, iron? Cast iron is iron that has such a high carbon content, higher than steel itself. Because people think, well, you add carbon to iron to get steel, and so how can, why do you call something, I don't know why they call it that, but cast iron is actually iron with our carbon content even higher than steel, and a blast furnace will usually produce cast iron as a result. But guess what? There are many methods to reduce carbon content in steel to make it more workable, and you have high carbon steel as a result. Did they have that in the medieval period? Yes, they did. Again, reading from the article from Bloomery Furnace to Blast Furnace, medieval smelters used an early variant of a finery forge, which is something that you do after the actual smelting, to reduce the carbon in the cast iron into high carbon steel. So the statement that through most of history, we didn't have the technology to get iron to the melting temperature, so which parts in history? Because if you're talking about medieval prehistory and parts of the history that are contemporary when, you know, crucible, which master steel was being used, yes! Yes, they did have ways they were able to liquefy iron. That's just a, like, uh, how are you making these statements without double checking them? And for much of history, we just didn't have the technology to do that. Instead, a special kind of smelter known as a bloomery was used. So here in the video, you're basically saying around the same time when certain parts, you're saying Asia, but mostly in India, had crucible steel or could make crucible steel, everyone else was left with bloomery steel. 
And in some cases and places, that's true, say like in Japan, and in some places in medieval Europe as well, but say all medieval Europe didn't, it's like, no, there are places in medieval Europe that had the flaming blast furnace as early as the 12th century. My goodness. And then you go on to get some things pretty drastically wrong about bloomery smelting as well. When European blacksmiths worked with the bloom, they often ran into the problem of carburization. That's where unwanted carbon from their charcoal fire got diffused into the ingot, the piece of relatively pure metal. <coughs> it was vastly more rare for too much carbon to be infused into the iron through a bloomery than not enough. The problem wasn't carburization, it was that there wasn't enough of it in most instances. It is actually much harder to produce high carbon steel through a bloomery uh, than what people assume. There are ways to do it, of course. The Japanese Satara is able to do it, usually on a matter of volume. That Satara is such a big bloomery furnace that on scale, when you get the massive bloom out, you can actually look at how silvery or bright certain aspects are to measure, you know, that gives you an indication of carbon content. High carbon content in iron makes it more silvery and bright. And then they, they break off chunks of high carbon steel from that bloom. And that's, yeah, so in a smaller bloomery furnace, there are much smaller little pockets of high carbon steel. And overall, uh, the whole, you know, bloom is actually very low carbon steel. Uh, sometimes just still iron in other instances, but in most instances, just low carbon steel. And so the problem being carburization, now, it's just, there wasn't enough of it. That was the bigger problem with bloomery steel. But again, there's nuance to it because you can absolutely still make high carbon steel through a bloomery furnace, but it becomes really difficult. Because remember what I was saying about the blast furnace? That when you liquefy iron, when iron actually becomes fully liquefied, it starts to really absorb a lot of carbon. And so the bloom works really well in that it doesn't liquefy the iron, because as soon as it becomes liquefied, it gets access to a lot of carbon. Where's the carbon? The fuel, okay? The coal that you're burning. And so anything that gets fully liquefied in a bloomery furnace is going to suck up as much carbon as it comes, and it's actually very hard to make high carbon steel, because as soon as you get to the point where the iron has melted enough to absorb enough carbon to get to high carbon, it's going to absorb too much, and you're just going to have wrought iron. And so it's almost two extremes that more often result out of a bloomery furnace technology, which is either more often low carbon steel, but if you push it, you really push it to the point where some of that iron does liquefy, that's when you get over carburization and you end up with cast iron. But what you're saying here is like, it's, it's the problems that are always making cast iron out of a bloomery. It's like, no, no, that's more of a case with a blast furnace that you're ending up with cast iron more often than not. You can remove it and get high carbon steel. So absolutely they're able to do that, but saying that problem exists with bloomery <laughs> Uh, uh, no, it's not how bloomery furnaces work. There's another problem that inherently exists with bloomery steel, and that is impurities. And this is where one of the inherent advantages does come out of properly made crucible steel when you fully liquefy it, and it's impurities. The, the impurities will rise to the surface in fully liquefied iron, but doesn't happen in a, a bloomery because the iron doesn't fully liquefy. It becomes very malleable, very spongy and stuff, and it absorbs carbon, you're able to make steel, uh, but it doesn't get rid of all the impurities. It can get rid of a decent amount, like, like the slag does melt out, but it gets trapped in a lot of pockets. But any culture that worked with bloomery steel had to work with the inherent problems that exist in it, not just medieval Europe. And so I singling out medieval, I don't know, there's this, like this hate for medieval Europe because they're so uncultured and civilized and there's this false perpetuating myth that medieval, you know, people, uh, yeah, their swords were crude and they were uncivilized and everything to the enlightened east and, and south and whatever, right? It's like, it does such a disservice to the technology and sophistication that existed in that time, and uh, I get really annoyed. And look, I would get annoyed if any culture was singled out unfairly like that and misrepresented, but it seems to happen to the one that I'm really interested in, the medieval period a lot, and so it really gets my goat. But every culture that worked with bloomery technology had to deal with those inherent problems. Again, look at Japan. The Tatara is a bloomery furnace. And so the Tamahagane is not pure when it comes out. It has a lot of imperfections in it. I've got a whole, you know, katana series that looks at studies and stuff like that where they find a lot of impurities in traditionally made, you know, historical katanas and stuff like that, which is the whole reason why they needed to fold the steel, okay? The whole purpose of folding the steel in the katana is to get rid of the impurities that results out of the tsar. It's a blueberry furnace with the inherent problems and it's a blueberry technology. So not just medieval Europe. It is anyone that is working with bloomery technology. And shame on you for ragging on medieval Europe because whatever, I don't know why, but it's like, look, I'm not saying this is your intent. I'm not saying you're in, you're trying to be 
outwardly, like if you have a, I'm not saying you have a negative, you know, hate or whatever bias towards something like that, but you're perpetuating certain stereotypical, you know, myths about the, and those myths have resulted in any number of stupid things and uh, it seems like you've just kind of, I don't know, caught onto it. Now, you do need some carbon to make steel, but if you overdo it, the metal becomes brittle. So it was necessary to control the amount of carbon in the steel, and on a separate note, you also had to know what temperature to forge the blade at. European blacksmiths didn't understand either. What? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Where the heck did you get that from? European blacksmiths didn't know how to regulate the carbon content of steel or the temperature to f what? Out of any comment that summoned me to react to this video, that one was it. Oh my goodness, that is astoundingly false. That is such an insulting statement to the blacksmiths of European history. And look, if you said it about any culture that was so astoundingly false, I would say they have a right to be insulted too. But you're the one who says specifically European. And what's astounding is the, the reality is the sophisticated complexity that they understood in steel manufacture was astounding. Like, like really high, like with the blast furnace, okay? They knew how to liquefy and then they would produce cast iron. Then they even knew how to reduce the, uh, the amount of carbon in it to get to high carbon steel. It is astounding. They, they, they knew so much about steel projection. Of course, trial and error, they know the science, they know the percentages, they know the actual elements like vanadium and all. It's like, uh, no, but they understood through trial and error what things rendered better results. And baking the iron beforehand removes the sulfur. And so that's a really good thing. They had baking pits, roasting pits, uh, where they roasted them because they often roasted the iron, not in every instance, but uh, if you're doing it, you know, proper, with trying to reduce as many issues that could arise, you would roast the iron beforehand. And then if you smelt it through a bloomery or even a blast furnace and stuff, they understood that the goal that they were going with. And so in a bloomery, which often produces lower carbon steel, they could carburize it. They would, there's, a, there's a technique of carburizing where they would put a low carbon steel something into a high carbon fire, like the actually soak it in the coals and stuff like that, and get the outside to absorb the carbon and carburize the outside. They knew that. There are so many points of evidence which utterly destroys this astoundingly ignorant and false statement that European blacksmiths just didn't know what temperature to forge the blade at is amazing. What temperature to forge the blade at? You're essentially saying they didn't know how to quench and temper steel properly, which is just astoundingly incorrect, okay? There are many points of evidence that they knew the advantages of quenching and tempering and what temperature you, so there's a set temperature in which you want to quench um, steel, okay? It's the austenite phase. So it's when the actual atomic structure of the iron goes from body cubic to centricubic. I forget the exact terminology, but austenite is when the uh, atoms essentially get more space in between and can fit things in between those atoms a lot easier, specifically carbon. And so when you put in carbon, that can be diffused into the iron and then you quench it quickly, you can trap the carbon where it's at. Depending on the type of quenching, it results in different metallic structures or crystal structures in the iron itself. For instance, perlite is one that you get when it's cooled down a bit softer. Perlite is iron, which is the actual chemical thing is ferrite, and ferrite is interspersed with these pockets of really, really high carbon and ferrite combinations, which is called cementite. And you see these cementite lines in the ferrite, and that is the perlite light crystalline structure of metal, which a lot of high carbon steels can result to if you don't quench it fast. But if you quench it fast and trap the carbon before it gets forced into these smaller condensed pockets of uh, cementite, you can create martensite. And martensite is a really high strength crystalline structure in high carbon steel. And then if you temper it properly, you can make a spring out of it. And guess what? They knew that in medieval Europe. In fact, they had spring steel. And you're wondering, when do they have spring steel? As early as the 14th century, or the 1400s. On. I need to check, it might be 14th century. Where? Crossbows. Metal crossbow, actual, you know, bows on crossbows were made out of metal and were so reliable that they made permanent crossbow actual arms out of four crossbows, spring steel, okay? It would have, it's literally impossible for them to do that if they didn't know what temperature to heat the metal to, to quench it to, and then to temper it to. Because it's not a spring when you when you actually just quench it directly when it reaches the austenite phase. You need to temper it right to actually get the springiness in it. Which means they understood exp 
explicitly in the most specific detail what temperature they needed to get the iron or the steel to to get the desired results. And you just said they didn't know how to do that, which is astoundingly false. Like, shockingly so. And that is just one point of evidence to show, like, for instance, blued armor, okay? When armor, you can actually blue it to give it a blue tinge. How do you do that? By heating it up to the right temperature. Oh, look, they understood the temperature and what to heat steel to to get desired results. Oh my goodness. And before you said they didn't know what temperature to heat the metal at, you know, all that stuff, you said that they didn't know how to control the right amount of carbon. <laughs> It's like, again, from the article, uh, from Bloomery Furnace to Blast Furnace, they literally found finery forges, which are specifically made to reduce carbon out of cast iron so they could get high carbon steel as a result. Like, <laughs> but no, they didn't know how to, they, they didn't know how to regulate carbon content in steel. Whether we actually have direct evidence of them not only manipulating carbon content down, but also manipulating carbon content up by case hardening. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts how bad that was, man. I'm sorry. Look, I like you. I'm not. This isn't a personal attack or anything. I know I can get animated. But it's mostly for entertainment value. You, you get that. But it's also I like to emphasize like, because some of those were rest, like wow. Uh, but again, it's not you personally. It's against the the misinformation, <laughs> the facts, the false facts. Sorry, you got to gosh. And by the way, like, it's not actually too hard to figure out carbon content in steel. There's a couple of ways to measure it, even in a loose way, not to the specific exact percent, uh, but the higher amount of carbon in steel, the brighter and more shiny it is. Okay, this is why cast iron looks really kind of silvery and stuff, or even pig iron looks really brighty and silver. And iron looks really dark. And so you can get an idea of the color, just by the color. You can also do a spark test. You know, when you put something on a grinder and get sparks off, the amount of sparks gives you an indication of the carbon content in the steel, because the more carbon, the more sparks, because oxygen is getting to it and it gets more sparks. Uh, <laughs> but no, there was no way for them to figure out how much carbon was in steel. They just didn't know that. This is more than making like a technical error where you're wrong. You're actually misrepresenting history where you're not just, you're actually saying they couldn't do something when the exact opposite is true. Not only could they do it, they could do it really well to a very specific and complex level. And to beat this dead horse even further, if you want further evidence of people in medieval Europe knowing the car how to regulate carbon content and also the temperatures for quenching and tempering, stuff like that, we can actually take medieval swords, medieval arms, weapons, and look at the microstructure of these blades and figure out how they were quenched and tempered based on what crystalline structure is the result. Remember what I was talking about? How when you uh, have high carbon, you heat it up and you let it cool it down a bit slower, but some um, uh, quenching does it, you can get perlite. Well, you can see perlite microstructures in medieval swords. Also martensite. Martensite is the result of specific quick quenching from the austenite phase. Okay, specific. And so we can actually specifically see in surviving medieval swords and armor, the type of heat treatment they applied to these objects. Categorical, irrefutable proof, evidence that they knew how to do this and do it well. European blacksmiths didn't understand either. And as a result, their blades were often brittle. As a result, their blades were often brittle. <laughs> I'm not saying all European swords are amazing. Like with any culture, there is a mixed bag and you can find, and more often than not, most swords will be average quality, okay? Not the best that they could make in that whole, you know, culture and the technology they can. But if you want to compare best to best, man, they're like some of the best European swords are amazing. And again, if you look at some of the best swords out of Japan are amazing. But to say all the swords were as great as the best forged katana folded, heat treated, all that proper, no. There was actually a lot of crap swords that were poorly made in Japan and in Europe as well, and in Asia, and in India, and things like that. To say that they're all phenomenal. And so when you just say blankly that European swords were brittle, I mean, I have an older video, but it's done well. Stupid things people say about medieval swords. That statement goes right on in there because that was a profoundly stupid statement to say that they're across the board, just brittle. Now, if anything, if you're looking at the mid tier and low tier quality of European swords, they're going to be soft, not brittle, okay? Because carbon content was lower the result of bloomery steel having trouble producing high carbon steel. And so first the brittle thing is wrong. If you're gonna be looking at the lower end, the result is softness, not brittleness. And then when you look at the mid to high range, especially the high range, but you know, like the higher end of mid range as well, swords are phenomenal, okay? Like 
guess what? They knew how to fold steel in medieval Europe too to get rid of impurities from bloomery steel. They were doing it a lot. So the idea that the katana is particularly, you know, special because it was folded, no. Heaps of people knew how to fold steel and that it, you know, got rid of impurities and stuff. And they, they did it almost as a standard practice in some instances you know, when you're dealing with bloomery steel. And then you have the great quality high carbon steel that they're able to get out of blast furnaces as well. And you don't have to look hard to find a great example of a very pure high quality steel that has a high carbon, which was probably uh, quenched and tempered into a spring sort from medieval Europe. There's more, of course, in the late medieval period. But and there's also sort of visual, you know, images that shows like, look at this one here. And I have a couple of other resources that very much indicate spring steel swords. These are swords being flexed, okay? Uh, so they had spring steel swords, and to get spring steel, that means the quenching and tempering needed to be bang on the money. And again, if you want proof of, of spring steel in the medieval period, look at medieval crossbows that have metal bows on them, okay? Spring steel once again. So are these brittle? Uh, is high quality, probably t uh, quenched and tempered spring steel swords and bows and things like that? Is that brittle? But no, European swords were just brittle, like, woo, come off it! But for Damascus blades, Asian blacksmiths had a different strategy. Crucible steel. Asian blacksmiths had a different strategy, crucible steel. Here's a couple of interesting hot takes, well not hot takes, but, but, but facts, facts, right? Uh, though it seems quite evident from, you know, evidence and historical records and stuff like that, that crucible steel was being made in, mostly in India and other parts and stuff like that. There's actually indications that crucible steel was known and made in different parts in Europe in the medieval period. Now, some people say it was uh, traded up and into that area because there's more evidence of large-scale manufacture of crucible steel and records of it in, say, India and stuff like that. But also means that someone in medieval Europe in different times knew how to do it. We have indications that uh, they made crucible steel out of Spain, for one. There's actually, uh, let me do that, I'll give the reference to that one. Specifically, the article Making Steel in the Middle Ages, crucible steel sabers with visible patterns show up in Russia. Uh, and so, again, either import ordered or made there. And of course, there are the Ulfbert swords, which is crucible steel swords in, from the Viking period. From all these references, we see that crucible steel was being made in certain areas. So one of the you know strongest reference points is Spain. And beyond that, there is heaps, like unarguable evidence of uh, the knowledge and idea of what crucible steel was, was known all throughout medieval Europe for many times and that it was good and highly sought after, but there were many other swords of equal quality and there were other ways of making steel as well. Because remember, you have to understand, one of the big prizes about Woot's Damascus steel is the pattern. It looked beautiful, okay? Now, people were able to replicate patterns through pattern welding. Uh, they did this in the Viking period as well. Like, Stunningly beautiful pattern welded swords, like amazing. And then high carbon steel swords that were made from blast furnace technology as well. And so there wasn't as massive a need that we need to know how to make crucible steel when they had other technology, like the blast furnace, which was far better in producing larger quantities as well, that exists in medieval Europe. And so, you know, the only need that they, for crucible steel, they didn't need crucible steel because they could make steel of high carbon content in higher quantities through blast furnace technology. And so if they wanted then the pattern in, okay, then they might want to get Woot's Damascus, the secret technology, the right iron study, how to make it. And so it's not to say that Damascus steel wasn't prized. It was, okay, again, mostly due to the pattern, not necessarily because it was universally better than all other swords. I've really tried to hammer home that point. There's a variable, there's a lot of Woot's Damascus swords that are of low quality, that are just room temperature heat treated, that, you know, sometimes have too high a phosphorus count or sulfur in it and were brittle and became more brittle and cold and other things like that. And these are historical accounts that we have. They're not Valyrian steel, okay? They're not magic things. They just had higher chance of being better because if made right, it would be high carbon steel. That's what crucible steel can produce when done right, but it's not the only technology to do it that I've just been repeating again and again because I really want to just hammer home that point, okay? You can make high carbon steel through bloomery technology. It's more difficult and more often than soft, but then they had blast furnace technology, which absolutely, <laughs> that makes you so much high carbon content in iron that it's uh, cast iron and, uh, and they went, beyond, you know, the difficulty of putting in high carbon into iron. And closing the bloom also meant that they could actually melt it, because as the carbon slowly diffuses into the bloom, it lowers its melting point and the iron starts to liquefy. That isn't the only reason why they were able to liquefy the iron. They also did different forges to be able to get the melting temperature really high. You see, 
with a bloomery furnace, you need the top open so you can keep feeding and stuff. And you kind of layer the, uh, the coal and the iron ore and coal, and then you keep feeding and stuff like that. But there are other smelting methods in which when you have a crucible and you seal it, all right, you're not adding any extra iron. It has your set amount of iron there, so you can actually seal off the furnace, okay? And uh, just keep pumping the oxygen in, in this moat, like at the top is sealed and, and there's only like a small little pocket down below, right? And by sealing it off, you can trap more heat in and get the heat high enough to liquefy it as well. So it's not just because the carbon is diffusing and has a low melting temperature. No, they, there was just other furnaces that they were able to make that could get hot enough to just liquefy it straight out. After melting the iron, it was then cooled very slowly to form iron carbide crystals, a mixture of iron and carbon, which created the structure necessary for skilled smiths to create the distinct swirling pattern of Damascus blades. See, these ingots had special impurities like vanadium, a rare element in Earth's crust. And vanadium served as a place where the iron and carbon could form crystals rather quickly, a process known as nucleation. That's a mouthful. Created the structure necessary where skilled blacksmiths could then create the pattern. Well, I fortunately gets this wrong, but to explain what they're getting wrong here, I'm going to bring in Ipo Swords himself to explain this specificity, the specifics of what's actually happening here, which is forming the, this glorious Damascus steel pattern. And also the picture that they show of, you know, the pattern being, that, that's, that's pattern welded. It's not the actual Damascus pattern. You, you can tell by, but anyway, thanks, thanks mate, take it away. Hi Shaq, thanks for having me. I'm Ipo Swords and I'm going to interject for just a moment here to talk about the specific way that crucible steel solidifies and how SciShow got it quite a bit wrong. In fact, they got it completely reversed to how it actually works. Which is a bit strange considering they cited the paper that describes a solidification system. In the paper they cited, Damascus Steel Revisited, it's revealed that the, the structures in crucible steel form because of dendritic and interdendritic regions which are low and high in carbide forming elements respectively. SciShow is quite correct in saying that CFEs, carbide forming elements, act as nucleation points for the aggregation of cementite spheroids, which are spheres of the hardest iron carbide. And this is what gives crucible steel its edge retention. What they did however get wrong is the order in which these patterns appear. SciShow said that the patterns appear because carbides arrange themselves into this dendritic matrix during the solidification, which is not quite right. In fact, what is arranged during the solidification is the locations of the carbide forming elements, which act as seeds or nucleation points later on after forging. And you may think this is a very semantic point and it's just me being interested because I'm a nerd. But there's a pretty significant problem with their description. If the pattern was caused by carbides that form when the ingot solidifies, the moment you heat it up to forge it, you would lose any pattern permanently, because those carbides would dissolve back into the steel. Carbon dissolves very readily and migrates quite quickly inside steel at forging temperatures. This is the reason heat treatment can work and can be deep hardening and go all the way through a blade. However, carbide forming elements are very insoluble in steel at forging temperatures. This is also why they form a matrix first. Because their melting temperature is different to steel, they can solidify into their matrix and then not re-dissolve into the steel as it's cooling. And that's why you don't get a homogeneous even distribution and why you get a pattern which is, by nature, heterogeneous. Because these CFEs don't dissolve readily at forging temperatures, they maintain their relative distances from each other as the ingot is forged into a blade. And as a result, when you thermally cycle that blade once it's been forged to shape, the patterns can reappear, because carbides can begin to form on those carbide-forming elements again, thus their name. And that heat treatment is important for a few reasons. The first is to normalize it or refine the grain, which prevents breakage because of excessively large grain size. And the other is that it allows those carbide spheroids, the cementite spheroids, to form. And these spheroids are what give crucible steel its hardness. So because SciShow misunderstood the way that these carbides form and when in the forging process, if we were following their description, 
you'd never be able to have pattern-forming, hypertectoid crucible steel. It simply wouldn't happen. What you'd instead have is something a lot closer to cast iron, in which case all of the carbon would di be distributed through all of the blade. And due to that homogeneous distribution of carbon, you'd have a brittle, useless sword. And that's not what we see in crucible steel. What we see in crucible steel is a perlitic or febritic base, which is a very soft iron carbide, with spheroids, which can be seen with the naked eye of very hard cementite. In fact, I've got an image here of a crucible steel saber in my collection that has visible spheroids. And these can only be possible if those solidification structures are carbide forming elements not if they're carbides, because these tiny little spheroids would have dissolved back into the steel. It also had to do with where the metal came from. Although they're called Damascus blades, the raw material didn't come from the city of Damascus, now in Syria. This one Mike Lodes himself has actually debunked a bit, where there is actually multiple sources of Damascus steel, uh, and one of the sources actually need Damascus itself. So yes, it does appear that you need iron ore that has a certain amount of vanadium in it, but guess what? There was a mine, the Wade mine, which is 87 miles from Damascus. And this gives credence to the fact that Damascus steel, true roots, Damascus steel, crucible, Damascus, oh, that term is such a mess now, uh, was not only mined near Damascus, but therefore very much could have been made in Damascus as well and sold from there as well. It's not to discount that Damascus could have been a trading hub which brought in a type of ingots from India as well. It just means India is not the only place. In 2009, though, German researchers finally got samples of Damascus sabers, and when they took a closer look at these blades, they realized that trace elements like vanadium were more than just a nucleation site. Hi, me again. Just going to interject for a tiny moment to talk about how I believe that SciShow might not be reading the papers they cite with quite enough care. And there's a very strong piece of evidence for that. In the video, they cite the vanadium link as having been discovered in 2009 despite also citing the 1998 paper that found the link, which they don't mention throughout the entire video. What's more, they even linked the follow-up paper by the same research team, which I'd imagine they also didn't read, given the fact they fundamentally misunderstood how the solidification process works. They got it backwards. Now, you might think it's rather unimportant and that I'm nitpicking whether they cite a foundational 1998 paper on which the entire research field is based, or a 2009 paper. But I'd argue that it makes a pretty big difference to making sure the correct people get credit for the work they did and how it shaped the research field today. I'd also argue that if you run a YouTube channel with over 6 million subscribers, it's probably in your best interest to actually read the papers you cite. But you know, what do I know? I only wrote my own thesis and got a Masters of Science from it. I clearly have no idea how to conduct proper research. Anyway, if I were SciShow, I might start reading papers a little bit more closely before reporting them to millions of people. Because eventually someone who has studied the subject is going to see that video and is going to call them out on it. And yeah, of course, whether you cite one paper or another can come down to which one is closer to the point you're trying to make and more relevant. But in this case, the foundational paper which discovers something like the role of vanadium and other carbide forming elements in the pattern formation capacities of crucible steel, you might want to use a foundational paper. It's respectful to the people who did the research, and it's more accurate. In their study, the scientists took their sample and dunked it in acid to see what they might find inside. And after a week, what was left behind were carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes are what they sound like tiny rolled up sheets of carbon molecules. And because the carbons are held so tightly together, they don't dissolve in the acid. The authors suspect that the vanadium and other impurities in the iron served as a catalyst, speeding up the formation of these nanotubes inside the blade. I'd also like to mention that the paper they mentioned about carbon nanotubes might not be quite what they think it is. Even in the original press releases by Nature, Verhoeven, the guy who wrote that 1998 paper, he discussed that what they're seeing might not actually be carbon nanotubes. 
See, what they did in that paper is they dissolved crucible steel and looked at what was left over after, and they found what appeared to be carbon nanotubes. What Verhoeven says is that they're probably more like spikes or rods of cementite in the actual steel, and that when you dissolve them in acid, what you're left with is a spike or rod of carbon that corresponds to that cementite spike. Carbon generally doesn't stay in its stable form when it's dissolved in steel. Instead, it gets combined with iron to make carbides, you know, the things we've been talking about the entire video, that form the pattern in the steel. You'll occasionally find undissolved pockets of graphite in steel, but this is actually a very bad thing for performance. You want the carbon to be dissolved in where it is, and not to remain as a non-metallic inclusion. What's more, other researchers have found that it could be an artifact of the method of imaging that they used, which is pretty common when you get things like electron microscopes that are needed to view carbon nanotubes. That's a larger problem for an entire field of science to solve, and whether there are carbon nanotubes or not kind of has to be corroborated with other research teams, and not taken as fact from one small research study that might have had a methodological flaw in how they found their carbon nanotubes. I'm not saying it's impossible. I am saying that carbon tends to dissolve into steel once you heat it up to forging temperatures. This means that blacksmiths were also nanotechnologists before it was cool, using carbon nanotubes to strengthen the blades. It has carbon nanotubes! Like, they're perpetuating something that is not confirmed. And in fact, again, coming under much more scrutiny when it can be explained away much easier. Because, yeah, if they are carbon nanotubes, like, the way that you're saying, you're trying to say that, because again, if something has carbon nanotubes in it, you need a vast amount for them to really do a lot of, you know, strengthening and stuff. To have just you know, small little bits here and there, it's not going to do much. And so I've always been skeptical about true crucible steel having carbon nanotubes. When I hear that, it's like, okay, it doesn't necessarily mean that the material is going to be any stronger due to their presence because it's going to be the amount, okay? And so they're saying we found carbon nanotubes. Like, okay, how much? I've never told, been told how much. Um, but this explanation seems far more likely, actually, uh, because the question is, yeah, where did they come from as well? But this one explains where they come from because of their elongated cementite spheroids. Well, cementite is just one of the naturally occurring parts in iron when you add carbon to it. And again, because I, I mentioned this in the different phases and crystalline structures of, you know, iron when you add carbon to it. So cementite is actually a portion of the iron, ferrite, which has a very high amount of carbon. And you get these cementite kind of lines in the perlite structure and stuff like that. And it, it, when you forge things and manipulate and stretch out steel and stuff like that, it looks like that you can elongate uh, some of these cementite spheroids. And so it's already, it explains it in a much more logical way. Uh, the other thing is, again, if carbon nanotubes made Wootz Damascus steel naturally superior to other steel, well, all the surviving examples, and there's actually a decent number of Wootz Damascus steel blades still surviving, would be all superior to all other sources. No, there's a mixed bag of quality in them that sometimes that they're not actually that great, depending on how they're made. And so it's not this inherent thing that makes them glorious and wonderful. And that's even if they really are carbon nanotubes, which doesn't seem to be the case. And so there we go. This has been a bit of a long ranty video, but yeah, that's what we do here in Shadowversity. When something like this comes on, we need to address it properly. And of course, a big, massive thank you to iPost Swords for joining me in this video, but also helping with the research. We teamed up, we did a tag team in uh, the uh, preparation for this video, finding out all the information, all the sources and documentations, things like that. And it was massive, lots of fun. So again, thank you. Uh, check out iPost Swords. He makes great content. Uh, link to his channel in the description below and also I have a card there for it as well. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. And look, I don't, uh, I, I, just to round off and end off, okay, I, I, I like SciShow. And I'm not blaming, I forget the name of the guy in the video, because um, I don't believe he did the research. And they probably, uh, SciShow has different presenters, different research and stuff like that. And whoever did this one, unfortunately, did drop the ball. But still, thank you for watching. It means, of course, I can correct the record. I hope you've enjoyed. And of course, I hope to see you again on the next video here on Shadowversity. So until that time, farewell.